Good evening, dear students. I welcome you on behalf of ACCA and Scan School of Accounting, Accountancy, Islamabad. I hope everyone is doing fine and geared up for today's session. Let me give you a brief review of previous two sessions that we had. In the first session, we were looking after the exam technique, the do's and the don'ts, the do's that are going to increase our chances to pass the exam, and the don'ts that are not really welcomed by the examiner and which may lead to the failure of examination. Further, the focus was to master the skill of time management. If we are able to manage the time allocated against each mark in every question, we will be in a position to do 100 marks of the paper. That is actually the case for many students who score the pass grade. If you are not attempting 100% of your exam, it is very difficult to get the pass grades as there are fewer chances since you have not attempted 100%. So the idea is you have mastered in managing your time so that you can complete your exam well on time and if there is some problem or there is some cutting done in your exam, you could revisit it comfortably. And other point that was of prime importance was discussed as while typing in contrast to writing, if we write something wrong, we can cut it. And when we revisit it, we see that we have wasted time on writing and cutting it. But while typing, we just backspace use the backspace button and we do not realize how much time we use to type and erase and this is potentially using our time without any notice so you have to be very careful while typing and the key here is that you don't rush into typing your answer until and unless you have perfectly understood the requirement and you have planned your answer accordingly. If you have planned your answer, you won't be writing the stuff that is not required or that stuff that you will have to erase after writing. So before writing, you have to think. Once you are comfortable, that this is the answer I am clear in my mind rethink eliminate the free words that are not required your answer should be crisp and crunch so that the examiner gets impressed with your personality being reflected in the examination please note you won't be there explaining the examiner what was in your mind while answering that question Whatever you have written in the exam is going to be depicted as your personality. And at the level of ATX, the examiner is looking for a person who is no more a tax junior or a tax intern. They are looking for a person who is a tax manager or a tax partner or a senior manager in some company dealing with the affairs of the company with some professional firm or some professional enterprise. So whatever you write will be depicted as your personality and you have to be very sure about what you write because this can either go to a pass grade or this may lead to a fail grade depending upon what you have written. Academically, we have discussed few topics as suggested by the students 
and uh, I will be welcoming the questions of yours in the question tab. You may write any topic you want me to cover, any specific question from the kit you want me to cover, or any specific area you want me to target. I will be targeting it in the future sessions. There is no restriction for you to suggest if any topic you are not comfortable with is required to be discussed it will be discussed for sure yesterday's session was based upon capital allowances and basis periods along with the touch of trading losses i hope the concept of basis period and capital allowances is pretty much clear for you guys if still there is any problem you can drop your question in the question tab i would urge you people to go to the kit and attempt some questions relating to basis periods capital allowances trading profits so that you could see if you are comfortable with the topic or not the agenda for today as discussed Okay. Opening the question tab. If anybody sends me the question, plus I could see. Okay. There it is okay so if there are any queries you want me to specifically focus you can drop it in the questions tab today we will be discussing some facts about pension as somebody asked me to uh, uh, to elaborate annual allowance charge i will be giving a brief background of pensions why the pensions are created what are uh, the reasons for creation of the pensions and what is the benefit for the hmrc for having pensions in place plus some specific attention to annual allowance charge, plus some aspects of value added tax. Apart from that, maybe if we are left with some time, we will be covering the terminal loss relief as requested uh, with, uh, with a practice question, a smaller question, but a question giving you a meaningful insight. So let's kick start today's session with the question we left yesterday. I will be going back to the question. I told you how to read out the question. What is the WhatsApp group link? Um, there is no group created uh, yet. Uh, I will see if I could create a group. I have sent my WhatsApp number to the students. If there is anything you want me to ask, you can ask me there okay so we were doing this question thomas sir please form a whatsapp group okay kamran let me uh, get the messages from the students who are uh, looking for a whatsapp group and i will be positively making it uh, tomorrow before the start of the session so that uh, if there are any queries you want me to ask till the webinar goes on i will be dealing with them and even if after the webinar uh, after the conclusion of the webinar you want me uh, you want anything related to atx i will be helping you guys out that is not a problem at all now going back to our question this is a march 2020 attempt question uh, thomas we uh, went through it we will be starting it all over again. Thomas requires advice on the tax implication of commencing trade, the choice of accounting date for his business, and whether or not to register voluntarily for value added tax purpose. Eins, his wife, requires advice on the tax implication of selling shares in respect of which relief has been obtained under EIS scheme. Now, I will be doing question uh, on a very elaborative 
based, I, I will be covering each topic that the question may touch. And I will be covering the details that are given here, but they are not required to be uh, the part of your answer. So if I analyze this first paragraph, it is very much clear that Thomas is a guy. Thirty-two. Question number thirty-two in Kaplan kit. Eric. Okay. Uh, I have noted this with me. Uh, we will be doing it uh, if we get time uh, today, or uh, I will see the topic uh, with which it relates, and I will be covering this topic. No worries at all, Tommy. No problems at all. Okay. So if we look at this paragraph, this paragraph is telling there is a, a sole trader, Thomas, who is asking for the tax advice as he is going to commence some trade. So after having comfortability with basis periods, it is very much obvious that he's a sole trader and he will be making basis periods since this is the start of his business. And when he's making basis periods, there might be some overlap profit. There might be uh, the choice he has to make between certain accounting dates that which one is favoring him for uh, the payment of tax. So these will be the considerations for this person uh, who is going to start the trade. Can anybody tell me that we make basis periods in case of corporation tax? I'm waiting for the answer. Is Ravi there? Can anybody tell me? The question, uh, Ravi, here is Do we make basis periods in corporation? And if we are not making any, uh, no, okay. Please uh, uh, allow me uh, till tomorrow to make the WhatsApp group. I have received so many requests for the WhatsApp group. I will be making that for sure. Everyone is asking me, I have brought my number. Please drop me a text so that I have the numbers of each of you so that I could make a WhatsApp group and kindly bear with me till tomorrow. I will positively making it for sure. Uh, please don't worry about that. And let's go back to the session because we need to. Uh, you just drop me uh, a text on my number as I have mentioned. Let's get back. Let's get back to the session. And uh, Ravi, you have answered me no, yes, because we are not making any basis periods for the corporation tax since the corporation tax is paid as per the accounting period it is already agreed in the legislation of tax uh, in the legislation of tax that a corporation will be paying its tax as per the accounting period so the books of accounts are already prepared as per the accounting period there is no difference between the tax year and the accounting period so no basis periods are made for the corporations only the basis periods are made for the sole traders because they have the choice to select their accounting date and if they select the accounting date in line with the tax year end you are not preparing any basis period but if it is different from the tax year and we are preparing the basis period this was the discussion okay now having considered having considered thomas we also are being asked in the question that if he could voluntarily register for value added tax purposes so here we will be discussing about the benefits of voluntary registration 
with value added tax and what are the possible implications that could arise in the case of thomas the other person in the question is Ains, his wife who is requiring advice on the tax implications of selling of shares in which relief has been obtained under ei scheme now this is one very critical point that is already mentioned that is giving you a hint about the answer of this question that Ains, his wife requires the advice on the tax implication on selling shares in respect of which relief has been obtained under eis scheme it means that his wife has already obtained certain relief that we will be finding out later in the question that relief is going to be revisited since these shares are being sold maybe the relief is going to be withdrawn maybe the relief will remain there this is what we have to discover so the opening uh, paragraph or the introduction of this question is pretty self-explanatory and this is explaining you a lot of things but since when since we are sitting in an examination where we have three hours to complete all the questions and this question is effectively of 20 marks we won't be spending a lot of time since we are practicing it that is why i am elaborating each of the line but when you are focused you are not going to be reading it the way i have read it or you are not going to apply your mind the way i have applied because everybody sitting in the examination will have some text knowledge and your mind will be running away with this uh, particular mindset that oh this might be the case oh this might be the case oh this might be the case you have to hold all your thoughts for a while until and unless you go to the requirement once you read out the requirement then you will be very much clear about what things you need to concentrate on okay i will straight away jump to the requirement since this will be guiding me number a requirement says on the assumption that thomas prepares his first set of accounts to 31st march 2020 explain with supporting calculations the difference in the total amount of tax payable by him for tax year 1920 as a result of the profit on the sales of sporting equipment being treated as trading income rather than chargeable gains okay now we have to dissect this requirement they say we are going to assume that thomas prepares his first set of accounts to 31st march 2020 so 31st march 2020 will be the accounting date for this person they are saying the command word is explain we did we discussed in pretty detail pretty much detail that if the command says explain then you have to explain but it says you have to explain with the supporting calculation so you are not at all going to ignore the potential calculations that could be featuring here so we will be explaining but we will be using a little calculations that can be of use and what we are going to explain with calculations is the difference in the total income of tax payable for the tax year 1920 as a result of profit on the sale of sporting equipment being treated as a trading income if he carries on as a trader and treats it as trading income what is going to be the potential tax and if he uses it as chargeable gain what is the potential tax so let's go back to the question and see how the supporting thing is working sporting equipment is being sold thomas is a uk resident and domiciled uses his capital gains annual exempt amount every year okay dividends of 2000 every year i have explained uh, uh, all the details about this in the yesterday session i will be quickly jumping on the relevant details so that we could solve the question uh, we i really want to solve two questions today along with uh, covering of pensions and terminal loss relief so i will be moving a little quick and if there are any questions again i would say you will be very much welcome to uh, write it into the question box there are no worries at all okay so thomas started selling items of sporting equipment from his collection during tax year 20 
1819, HMRC agreed that these sales should be subject to CGT in 2018-19. In April 19, Thomas started purchasing and selling more items of sporting equipment such that HMRC said he will be regarded as trading with effect from 6th April 2019. Thomas will not be required to register for value added for foreseeable future. Thomas will, however, consider registering voluntarily. This might uh, link with the second requirement. And what are the expected trading results? Thomas is considered either is considering either the 31st March or 30th April for the end of his business. Thomas estimates his total income less expenditure for 12 months for the period of March. Will be 11,500. Each item of the equipment is purchased and sold for no more than 1,000. All of the costs he incurs are deductible for tax purposes. Thomas expects his profits to increase steadily after 1st April 2020. So each line is meaningful. Each line is having some relevance to the requirement. Now the requirement has asked me to explain what would be the liability or what would be the tax payable if this sporting equipment is treated to be sold by a person carrying out trade or sold out by a person as a capital gain. Capital gain part is pretty simple. You could see it says that any item is sold for no more than 1000. This refer and the supporting sporting equipment. Can, any, can anybody explain the supporting equipment falls in which categories for capital gains? Anyone? Pawad, I believe you are there. Ravi, can you please answer? Etisham, Abimbola. There are many people who are uh, continuing from the first session. I would request you to please answer. The item being sold out for no more than 1000 pounds falls in which category for capital gains? Yes, it's a channel because it's a supporting sporting equipment. Sporting equipment can never be intangible. It will be tangible. It will be movable. So we could say simply that this falls in the category of chattel. So if we say that if we treat it as chattel, then what would be the case? The chattels being purchased and sold for less than 6,000 pounds, the chattels being purchased and sold for less than 6,000 pounds does not raise to any implication of CGT, they are simply exempt from CGT. Yes, right, we said Ravi, there will be no CGT. Okay, let's quickly go through the rules of chattels so that we could have a refresher session of that. So if, if somebody could tell me if, if we sell out a chattel having cost and sale proceeds for more than 6,000, then what is the treatment? We are selling out a chattel whose sale proceeds and cost is more than 6,000. Okay, Fawad, I believe the exemption is for the chattels that are being sold out and purchased for less than 6,000. And for the question I asked, it is chargeable as normal CGT computation. Yes, CGT will be charged. So you will be charged CGT at 20%, okay. If more than okay, very good, very good. Uh, I am happy that you are all uh, showing the engagement. That is very, very uh, welcome. Okay. So uh, if 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 the cost is less than six thousand and selling proceeds are more than six thousand, what do we do?
can anybody tell me if the cost is more than six thousand sorry okay if the cost is more than six thousand and selling proceeds are less than six thousand then what do we do but it is chargeable but we deem the selling proceeds as six thousand kindly note that where we are selling chattels having cost more than six thousand but selling proceeds less than six thousand we deem the selling proceeds as six thousand this rule is limiting the loss since in one case cgt has been exempted where the cost and selling proceeds are both less than six thousand so hmrc has reserved you to capitalize on more amount of the loss here they're limiting the loss by deeming your sale proceeds to be six thousand limiting the loss okay and the last thing we could say is if the selling proceeds are more than six thousand and the cost is less than six thousand then what do we do yes definitely these are all chattels ravi anything that is tangible and movable it is chattel there are different rules for chattel okay let me let me just uh, 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 write it here for you people so that uh, uh, number one rule is chattel sold and purchased for less than 6000 you everybody told and they were clear about it it's exempt okay in the other case chattel sold and purchased for more than six thousand they are charged in normal way third is if the chattel sold for less than six thousand and purchased for more than six thousand selling proceeds are deemed to be six thousand this is what i'm talking about and when we deem selling proceeds as six thousand so consider uh, an example where a chattel is sold for five thousand and its cost was nine thousand so you will be treating the selling proceeds as six thousand in original case the loss would have been four thousand but when you treat it as six thousand the loss would be limited from four thousand to three thousand limiting your loss and the last but not the least if the chattel sold for more than six thousand and purchased for less than six thousand then you take lower of normal cgt calculation and number two marginal relief you calculate it by five divided by three selling proceeds minus six thousand so any uh from both of these computations the answer with the lesser amount will be treated as your relevant answer i hope there is no problems in general now okay we are going to the solution we have discussed 
if it is treated as a capital gain uh, as a capital in capital terms there would be no tax but if it is treated as a trader a sole trader he will be definitely if no tax is being paid he will be paying cnic's uh, he will be paying nic's nic's relevant is the class 4 nic number 1 number 2 is the class 2 nic in this case i have written you the answer as thomas is carrying out a trade of selling sporting equipment the following liability will be arise in case of being treated as an income tax thing national insurance contribution the class 2 nic we know that there are number of weeks always 52 it is mentioned if it is otherwise and 2.95 is the fixed rate so 153 pounds will be the uh, fixed nic that we all know then the other one is class 4 nic and how do we calculate there is a basic uh, uh, a nil rate band you could say uh, till 9500 and the question has specifically mentioned that uh, after all the deductible expenses his trading profits are 11500 so 11500 minus the nil rate band for this into 9% equals 180 so the total tax tax payable here will be the nic is 153 plus 180 that is triple 3 so this is the amount of tax that he needs to pay if he operates as a sole trader for this particular transaction but if it is treated as a capital disposal i have written it for you that there would be no capital gain tax to be paid as they are chattels with the cost and proceeds both less than six thousand so it is exempt from the tax the difference in the total tax which will be payable by thomas for 2019 is the increase of triple three he says that he is not going to treat it as a capital transaction he wants to treat it as a trading income thing so if he treats as uh, uh, this as the trading thing he will be paying an additional tax of triple three pounds since the additional nic's will be imposed any questions till now okay i have a question relating to nic's what is NIC? Is it an additional tax? Yes, it is 3.05. Thank you, Adisham, for the correction. Okay. So tell me, uh, uh, what is NIC? Is it an additional tax or what? It is an insurance. Why it is given? For the social security benefits in case of any problem, you will be availing, uh, you will be entitled to all the social security benefits if you are paying the NIC. So basic point to note about nic's is that it is an additional tax imposed by the hmrc on a person specified by hmrc if it is being imposed on an employer it is the primary responsibility of the employer to pay that nic for instance in case of employment we have seen that employers are paying nic for having employees we see that there are cases where uh, there is class uh, uh, one uh, secondary and class one ANIC where the employer is paying the NICs on the behalf of employee. And we see that the employee is being benefited. But in this case, it is very much obvious and it should be known to each and every student that this is not something extraordinary being done by the employer for the employee. This is paid by the employer for enjoying the status of having the employees this is an additional tax being imposed on the employer for having employees not any uh, okay i guess this is complete from my side in this case if there is any problem you can ask me okay how we know 
sir class 2 and class 4 will be impacted in each case there is it is very much clear see uh, you you have to uh, develop this mindset in your of yours that if the person was not trading was not trading initially and now he is trading so a trader for himself is going to pay two nic's that is class 2 nic and class 4 nic it is obvious but if 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 it, it would have been mentioned that he is having employees it it would be probable that we included the class for employer nic's as well in this case okay i believe uh, i i have created much awareness about this topic while calcul uh, while uh, solving out this question if still there is any problem you can always ask me so uh, the five marks are secured you could see that only three to four lines or five lines are enough with minimal of the calculations i have explained what is going to be the impact if the capital transaction is not treated as a capital transaction but it is treated in uh, it is treated as trading uh, profit okay so we go to the second requirement it is a very classic uh, case for the understanding of the choice of the accounting date for any trader and it relates to the basis period that we have uh, done uh, yesterday it says identify thomas basis period for the tax year 2021 if he adopts a uh, year and date 31st march okay or 30th april and state two advantages for thomas for adopting 30th april as his year and again this is for five marks now look at this question what the question is saying you question is saying you that if you adopt 31st march 2021 or you adopt 30th April 2020 there are two dates that are given to you that you could adopt and he says if you adopt 30th April there will be two tax advantages that Thomas will have so the question again is giving you the hint that you will be benefited if you adopt 30th April as your accounting rate so what will be the benefits can anybody tell me first of all uh, it says identify thomas basis period for 2021 it is very simple the first basis period will be 12 month ending to 31st march 2021 as he has mentioned and the other one will be uh, you could see if it's 30th april then it could be 12 months ending 30th April 2020. They are easily being identified. Now, what is the benefit? The answer is written for you. The income tax liability for the tax year 2021 will be due for payment for by 31st january 2022 as per self-assessment rules adopting a 30th april year end maximizes the interval between earning profit and paying the tax on those profit if 30th april is the year end in first year rule you will be ending your accounts to 5th april then you will be making an other uh, basis period so this is going to give you enough time this will be giving you enough break between uh, the payment of the tax and the actual earning of the profit. So this is going to be the profits will be taxed twice as they will be lower profits. Yes, 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 you're right. So the first advantage by adopting 30th April will be there will be an extended time between the actual earning of the profit and the payment of tax on those profits. The second uh, in this particular case would be a 30th April year end is financially beneficial for Thomas as the profits for his business are expected to rise each year. It has mentioned in the question that the profits are going to rise each year. So the smaller period, lesser amount of the overlap profits, this will be as said by Evelyn. And secondly, 
If the basis period of 30th April rather than 31st March 2021, it will result in an earlier period of profit and therefore a lower level of profits being taxed. Initially, the lower level of profits will be taxed. This is number one. Number two, when the profits will be rising, you will be having enough time or I would say more than enough time to 31st March for the, uh, uh, for the profits being earned and for the profits being taxed. So if you get more time, you are comfortable doing enough tax planning so that you could have the cash flow advantages number one so that you could position yourself better for the betterment of your trade so 30th april is going to benefit you this way and in this case your taxable total profit will be known much earlier for you which means that you could have more time for planning in respect of for example if you want to make any payment on account through self assessment system or if you want to make any if you wish wish to make any pension contributions you will have enough time of planning uh, for all these aspects and you may be benefiting It depends upon the case. Okay, I, I'll, I'll explain it again. I just need to finish this. So if there is any problem with this, the advantages for adopting 30th April year end, number one is the profits are lower initially. So uh, overlap profits will be lesser. Secondly, you will have more time to plan since the date of realization of profit and the date of taxation will be having enough time difference you can be better planning for different things okay okay disham coming back to your question if the direct calculation if it says the direct impact direct calculation is very easy to do for instance, if, if it says that uh, what will be the impact of class 2 NIC, it was not already considered. Now they are considering it. You simply apply class 2 NIC. It never depends on anything. But if it says uh, that a person is a high rate taxpayer, you have to pay attention to what I say. If a person is a high rate taxpayer, if a trader is a high rate taxpayer, it means that his profits are more than 37,400. So we are not going to consider 9,500. We don't need to leave 9,500 initially we could straight away jump to the second part of the calculation if it says it's uh, a high rate taxpayer we will simply uh, multiply it to the relevant percentage of the nic we won't be doing the full calculation we will just be multiplying it with the relevant percentage that i believe is two percent if it says it's a high rate taxpayer i hope this clarifies the point you asked okay so we are done with the two question uh, two uh, requirements that are the 10 marks and uh, i have tried to explain you that what potential things can uh, can divert your mindset and can can actually consume your time without earning you any marks and what are the points that are straight away going to be giving you marks if you write them straight away okay the third part is explain two matters which thomas should consider in deciding whether or not it would be financially beneficial to voluntarily register for value added tax can anybody tell me this they are asking you what are the benefits for voluntarily registering for value added tax okay i will be guiding you on this if Thomas supplies are VAT registered, recover input VAT, claim input VAT. You are right, but you cannot recover input VAT if the other persons are not VAT registered. Is it so? If you your, you if you get yourself registered and able to reclaim your input VAT, okay, good it means that you you know you know the implications okay that that's very nice that's impressive 
avoid penalty and late payments that's very nice again thank you very much okay so if thomas suppliers are vat registered thomas will be charged vat on his purchases which he will only be able to reclaim if it is if he is registered for vat himself now consider the situation if his suppliers are vat registered and he is not vat registered he will be charged vat but he will not be able to reclaim that input vat being paid this is the number one benefit he could simply avoid the situation by registering himself he can always reclaim the input vat number one this is clear i hope however if he purchases from non vat registered business or members of, of the public he will not suffer any input vat so there will be no financial benefit for registering he is not purchasing from the vat registered business so they are not charging him any input vat there is no point of registering because there is no financial benefit for the registration but here this uh, point raised by etisham hamid becomes relevant that if somehow he had to be uh, if he is passing the limit of uh, the compulsory registration and he forgets to register if he is already registered he will be able to avoid the penalty and the late payments so if thomas customers are bad are registered for that now supplier part is done now we are back to the customer part if thomas customers are registered for vat they will be able to reclaim the vat charged by thomas on the equipment this is number one thing again we have done with the suppliers now it says about the customer if you are registered for vat you will be charging your customers vat and if they are not vat registered they will be not comfortable dealing with you but if they are vat registered they will be comfortable they because they could easily reclaim their input vat it says however if they are not registered the vat will represent an additional cost for them and they will move to your competitors since this is not going to yield them any competitive advantage or any uh, better cost being offered by your side and eventually uh, if he wants to stay in the business he will uh, be uh, taking the burden of all that vat if he's, he if he opts for vat registration and he does not charge his customers that vat he will be uh, being he will be, be he will uh, feel the burden he will be actually bear the burden of that vat himself i hope it is clear for you any questions okay okay that's nice next thing up is the last requirement okay it was pretty simple it was just for the three marks you could easily have gained three marks it is pretty simple and uh, till now 5 plus 5 plus 3 13 easy marks now you could see if you have the brought forward knowledge from tx examination you could see everything in this question everything coming your way is related to tx examination there is no point yet you have incorporated from the technical areas extended in atx exam do you agree with me the first question of five marks the expression to explain is different but the knowledge is the same as in tx examination again in the second part again it is the same knowledge that you have already from your tx examination there is no new technical area here except the explanation part and the third one again this is what you have learned already in tx examination the benefits of the compulsory uh, the benefits of the voluntary registration and the disadvantages of the voluntary registration so 13 marks appearing in march 2020 examination of atx are completely covered through tx course so till now if you have managed to close your eyes for tx course or syllabus content you are mistaken you have to open your eyes and you have to start looking for that course because this is the exam paper and it is clearly depicting that 13 marks are coming from tx examination you cannot simply close your eyes to that in the examiner comments that we covered in the first section i 
I have shown you what examiner has said again and again that the students were unable to display the knowledge gained in TX examination. So the TX examination is very critical and crucial for your pass grade. You cannot simply ignore that. You have to be very much vigilant and you have to be very much on toes when it comes to the TX course because all the course of ADX it is based upon your TX course. I hope it could uh, be a very good wake up call for all of you. Thank you. Now, the last one, somebody asked about EIS. So let's 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 just explore that. Explain the tax implications of INS of her intended sales of Tavira limited shares on 1st June 2020 and calculate her after tax proceeds from the sale. Again, this is the most common type of question that features in P6 examination that it specifies what proceeds you have to calculate after tax proceeds. The proceeds are the sale proceeds. You complete the calculation, you get the gain or you get the loss, you adjust it with the proceeds and that figure is your after tax proceeds. There are a lot of students doing it wrong by taking the cost element here. The cost element is no, is not linked or connected anyways when it says after tax proceeds after tax proceeds after tax proceeds means you have calculated the chargeable gain or the allowable loss number one done the second thing is the proceeds the sale proceeds you have consider the sale proceeds again take your chargeable gain or allowable loss you net it off and you get the after sale proceeds i hope this is clear and this is worth seven marks Okay, let's go uh, to the description of Ains. Ains, she is a UK resident and domicile is a high rate taxpayer. Okay, I, I go back to the question. Why is one moving? She is UK resident and domicile. Please zoom a little. Okay, sure. I is the UK resident and domicile. She's a high rate taxpayer, has made or will make no disposals for CGT purposes other than described below. Okay. The first sale is sale of painting. I sold a painting on 4th July 2017 for proceeds of 196,000. The sale gave rise to the gain of 86,000. So as I told you in the very first session that if the calculation is being done, you are not supposed to recalculate it. They have clearly calculated the gain for you. It says the proceeds are 196,000 and it says the gain is 86,000. You are not going to run for finding out the cost. What were the cost? I need to calculate the gain again. No need to that. Okay. There is some issue with the screenshot. So uh, for my convenience, I am zooming it out. I will be zooming it again. Uh, please bear with me on this. And it says that I subscribed for 72,000 shares. Uh, uh, I subscribed 72,000 pounds for 20,000 shares of T Limited on October 8, 2017. These shares are qualifying EIS shares. So they are qualifying. It means that any tax credit uh, that can be availed will be availed by trivia and in uh, the uh, uh, Opening paragraph it says that they have already obtained the EIS benefits if there was any so this is the key point that relates to the background uh, or the introductory paragraph number one uh, uh, Give me a second Okay, I hope you could hear me. Ains elected to defer the maximum possible amount of the gain on the sale of the painting 
against the purchase of these shares ains obtained eis relief of 18600 against her income tax liability for tax year 1718 the relief is 18600 and it intends to sell all the shares of t limited for 95000 on 1st june 2020 so if these shares are sold when were they when the relief was obtained in 1718 and they are sold for 95000 on 1st june 2020 if undertaken the sale would qualify for entrepreneur relief so the time limit says that if they are sold on this date specified there may be the uh, reversal of the tax credit that has been already been taken okay uh, i hope this is clear now explain the tax implications for ains for her intended sale of t limited shares on 1st june 2020 and calculate her after tax proceeds from this side now you could see very conveniently that the gain they showed of certain thing other than these shares is not being asked in the requirement it is just linked to the rollover or deferral of the gain and it is provided for that reason the the requirement is clearly asking for the tax implications for ains for her intended sales of t limited share so you are not going to uh, develop the work around for the other disposal okay let's go to the answer i hope you could see the screen If the shares in T Limited are sold on 1st June 2020, I will have owned them for less than three years. So the three years time is not completed. There will be consequences. The basic consequences, the tax credit given will be gone. A chargeable gain of 23,000, 95,000 minus 72,000 will arise on the sale, and the EIS income tax relief obtained, which is already mentioned in the question. when the shares were acquired will be withdrawn simply as the shares will be sold at a profit the full amount of tax credit originally given of 18600 will be reclaimed by hmrc in addition the sale of t limited shares will result in the gain on the sale of the painting which was deferred on the acquisition of shares being bought back into charge so that thing is going to be chargeable because it was deferred with this now it becomes chargeable the other uh, gain that you have deferred previously becomes chargeable it is not directly become chargeable it is becoming chargeable because you are selling out these shares the gain on this disposal was 86000 but the maximum amount of gain deferred was restricted to the qualifying expenditure of 72000 so this is a pretty straight forward question you are not completing the tenure of 3 years so simple calculations the only tricky part here was the tax credit given will be reclaimed by hmrc and you will be suffering tax on that okay this question is it again in the 7 marks question uh some uh, calculations of uh, roll over relief that is the business asset disposal relief uh business asset replacement disposal relief you could see uh, this calculation was again previously done in tx and now being again being examined in atx so please uh, do uh, consider tx course content they are very crucial for you any questions till now so that i could move on to the next question okay tell me if we move to the next question or first we uh, take a little uh, hit of pensions or terminal loss i am waiting for your comments okay if there is any difficulty in terminal loss okay okay before moving on to next question we will be doing uh, a, a, a short uh, hit on pensions and uh, a detailed hit on terminal loss i will be doing one question of terminal loss because it could be it can be well explained through 
uh, an example uh, guys should we take a break here or uh, we continue working okay great so the pensions again if you could okay i i'll, I'll open a document and i'll start writing it for you pensions basically if you consider a person uh, who is earning well in in his early time and when he becomes old uh, he is not being supported by his family for meeting up his medical expenses or something else he will be straight away dependent upon the government he will be looking uh, looking at the government to support that person for his expenses and if the government starts supporting each and every person who is not able to support themselves this will be arising this will be causing a lot of burden on hmrc to support people who are not able to meet their financial needs obviously when you grow older your financial needs never end you need the finances if your uh, offsprings are not bearing your financial uh, needs and you are done uh, spending everything you earn you will be having nothing at the end and you will be totally dependent on the hmrc but hmrc cannot be supporting each and every person because this is going to increase the burden on hmrc and the uh, and the funds they have uh, uh, wasted for the development of the economy will be wasted on supporting uh, these people so they had to find an idea they had to strike something that these people when young when earning could simply save some of their money for the rainy days or for the days when they are done working so in this case we have two proposed benefits number one we have we have type of pension number one is can anybody tell occupational pensions what is the benefit of occupational pension can anybody tell it's a can anybody tell is it exempt if it is exempt okay there is one concept i want to tell uh deduct from salary very good at the please look if something is exempt from tax it is not going to give you any tax deductibility this is very much important to know this is very critical to know if you say this income is exempt if an equal uh, loss is going to arise from that portion where the income was exempt there will be no benefit for that loss so you cannot say you cannot use this word exempt for such things in p6 you won't get any marks or you would end up in trouble because the examiner never wants this uh, non clarity of concept so this is not exempt this is deducted from employment income okay er can you explain okay the second one is personal employer okay no we are not talking about the employer here we are talking about the employee specifically for the person who is making the contributions for himself here and when we say about personal pension contributions what is the benefit for personal pension contribution now this is a tricky one who can answer there are certain various benefits for this okay very good 
paid net okay very good very good so the number one is you pay 80 percent and get 100 percent back number one yes hmrc will be will contribute 20 percent very nice this is number one number two uh, it will extend the basic and high rate bands okay what is number three very right it will reduce adjusted net income very nice this, this was the point i was looking for many students miss out on that reduces adjusted net income very right okay so these are the benefits of the personal pension contribution if they are registered with hmrc if they are not registered okay tommy i get it very nice very nice okay if they are not registered with hmrc no benefit is going to be given okay occupational schemes are run by the employer himself or any financial institution on his behalf and when we talk about the personal pension scheme it is run by the by simply the financial institutions who master in this service any clear any problem the people who could contribute here are the employee himself and the employer on his behalf is it so and in this case the employee himself the employer on his behalf or even an unemployed person can contribute to the pensions i hope this is clear okay this is it this is the basic structure of pensions we have now we get benefit the benefits are explained benefits are given in line with certain rules that are being placed number one we have to look for is the benefit is given as per higher of one uk relevant earnings number two what is a and i adjusted net income value well, when you calculate uh when you are calculating the personal allowance you calculate adjusted net income and if adjusted net income is more than hundred thousand pounds you reduce the personal allowance available basically the personal allowance is given for the underprivileged people and the benefit is being taken by every person in the economy of the uk so by introducing the adjusted net income concept they are limiting uh, uh, the benefit being wasted uh, the benefit the extra benefit uh, being taken by the uh, privileged people uh, through personal allowance if it is not clear Ravi, let me know i will try uh, uh, to add a question in which we have the calculation of adjusted net income for personal allowance so that it gets clarified okay the, the other thing is 3600 i need to be a little quick to wind up pensions before we go on to the break okay benefit is given as per the higher of uk relevant earnings and 3600 so what are the uk relevant earnings uk relevant earnings include the trading income and the employment income and the fhl income okay quickly go through what is fhl it is furnished holiday letting right if it is fhl is furnished holiday letting they are specifically to uh, the lettings of uh, lettings for the seasonal uh, trips of people and it has specific uh, uh, conditions to meet to qualify for furnished holiday letting it is treated as a separate rate they are capital allowances available against this it is completely treated as a separate rate other than 
the rules of property business income it is treated as a separate trade it is very much important to know sometimes uh, in uh, atx examination they ask you for certain reasons uh, to qualify uh, for uh, for a property to qualify for furnished holiday lettings there are it should be available for two 10 days in a season and among two 10 days it is actually let for one of five days there is a cap of 155 days of longer term occupation on this you should be uh, realizing profits of, out of this yes Evelyn you are right okay so uh, the annual allowance charge basically comes through this portion you will be giving the, given the benefit uh, from pensions on the higher of UK relevant earnings, trading income, employment income, official is included in this, and 3600. Uh, I hope this is clear to you people. So, for instance, I say a person who has pension contribution equivalent to 50,000 pounds and UK relevant earnings of 45,000 pounds. Okay, can anybody tell me how much uh, pension contributions will qualify for benefit? Very nice, 45,000. The amount qualifying for benefit will be 45,000. Please look here. The UK relevant earnings is 45,000. Your pension contributions are 50,000. Your contributions are more than UK relevant earnings. It says that the benefit is higher off. You have to look for the higher off. Okay. Among these two, the higher off is 45,000. The pension contributions you made are exceeding the limit. So you are not encouraged to exceed the limit. Simply that 5,000 of your pension contributions will not be attracting any tax relief it will be wasted only 45000 will be given are we clear till now great i i have another question i say if uh, your pension contributions are again 50000 and your uk relevant earnings are 60000 in this case how much will be the benefit Yes, it is restricted. You, you, you get it. Okay, what again? You're very right. The benefit in the second case will be 50,000. I hope everyone is clear for the application of this rule because the annual allowance charge is based upon the application of this. Okay, great. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this what we have agreed is the benefit will be given on the higher of UK relevant earnings and 3600 in this. We have displayed in these two cases now i say that there is something we call as annual allowance annual allowance is what it's a overriding limit it's an overriding limit you know what an overriding limit is can anybody tell Okay, no, no worry at all. Overriding limit is that it remains effective. I will I will display why we say that it is an overriding limit. For the current year, the annual allowance is 40,000. It says that you cannot contribute. Okay, you can contribute more than 40,000, but the benefit on the pension contributions in excess of 40,000 will not be given the benefit till 40,000 contributions will be given. So if I contrast this 40,000 with any of the above case, I, I am assuming that I'm considering it with 45,000. Please tell me if you are with me on the concept I am trying to make. We say that there is a person who has done the pension contributions of 50,000, whose UK relevant earning is 40,000 and the annual allowance overriding limit is 40,000 pounds for the year. Now, as per the UK relevant earnings, the amount qualifying for the benefit will be 45,000. Are we clear to this? Okay. But the annual allowance says that 
the above rule allowing you the benefit of 45000 is not as per this rule so there is a contradiction between these two rules the uk relevant earning says that you can benefit on 45000 but the annual allowance says you can benefit on 40000 the hmrc has deliberately placed these rules what they want you from you is you follow three steps number one you calculate calculate the amount of contributions qualifying for benefit through uk relevant earnings rule in the above case if you could see in my screen you have taken 45000 as qualifying amount okay i hope we are clear till now in the second point we say that calculate the amount of contributions attracting benefit above the annual allowance okay so what is the amount of annual allowance 45000 with the benefits and 40000 was the annual allowance so in this case the amount in excess are 5000 pounds so in the third step you simply take the excess amount that is we have calculated 5000 pounds as chargeable as annual allowance charge under non savings income so now one rule has given you the benefit you have taken the benefit no worries benefit taken in the other case you have taken the amount out that is taken that has uh, taken the additional benefit and you are adding that additional amount as annual allowance charge under your non-saving income that is your earned income this will be taxed this will be taxed and the benefit taken will be withdrawn by hmrc okay i hope you are clear on this now if there is any problem please ask me i'm here to explain it again okay i consider you have uh, understood the concept uh, Ravi, you were worrying about the annual allowance charge. I hope that annual allowance charge is clear that the annual allowance charge arises on the amount that have qualified for the benefit through UK relevant earnings rule in excess of annual allowance. That amount is added to your under your non saving incomes where it is taxed again and the benefit given originally has been withdrawn through this calculation annual allowance is 40000 every year this can be carried forward the amount that is not used in any particular year can be carried forward and the carry forward needs you to be the opted member of the pension scheme by hmrc if you do not opt for the pension schemes for any particular year there will be no carrying forward of that year being allowed so for being allowed in that case you have to opt for being registered uh, 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 for being opted to the pension schemes for annual allowance to carry forward you have to be you have to opt for 
the pension schemes. This is number one. And when you carry forward the annual allowance, you use the annual allowance of the current year on priority. And maximum years that it can be carried forward is three years. I hope it is clear. If there is any problem, you are welcome to ask. Okay, I believe uh, uh, the session has uh, been for more than uh, uh, an hour and a half. So let's have a short break. Can you scroll up, please? Yes, sure, for it, Ravi. If you want, I can share these handouts with you. That is not a problem. Okay, I will be sharing it. Okay, guys, let's have a break. We will be resuming the session in 15, 20 minutes. And uh, till then, uh, I would request you to please freshen up and we will try to conclude uh, the terminal losses and the question I shared uh yesterday so that we have uh, this session concentrating on some questions and some topics as well further i would be requesting you to uh, type the topics that you want me to cover in tomorrow's session so that uh, the session is actually uh, beneficial for you Okay, Evelyn. Okay, I'll share it. Okay, guys, see you at 10 20. Thank you. Evelyn, I have sent it. Okay, guys, see you at 
Okay, guys, are we back? Okay, I'll be waiting for next two, three minutes. Okay, guys. Before moving on to the question, uh, as requested, let's uh, conclude terminal loss first. We will be doing a question for terminal loss as well. I hope everybody is back, and uh, uh, let's conclude this uh, terminal loss thing. Okay.
what is the terminal loss if anybody could answer me we say that loss of final 12 months of trade is called terminal loss so the trade is ceasing in this case and these are the final 12 months of the trade the business is going to cease and the loss incurred at the end of the business and the loss incurred at the end of the business is generally not at not in combination termed as terminal loss but we say that the loss of final 12 months of trade is called the terminal loss so any problems okay so while doing this uh, while attempting the question of the terminal loss or while trying to understand what terminal loss is once you identify the final 12 months of trade and uh, you could simply do certain steps to find out uh, the terminal loss actually the treatment for this is we set it off against total previous three taxis okay uh, so you guys with me you're back from the break just want to make sure that i don't uh, move on without all of you being attentive as as any point missed on this will limit the scope of understanding this okay i assume that everybody is here so any loss incurred in the final 12 months of trade is called terminal loss the treatment of it is we set it off against the trading income of previous tax years when we set off against the previous tax year it is obvious that tax refunds will arise and whenever tax refund arise we need to be uh, administratively uh, not burdenized actually so the FIFO or the LIFO choice in paper we forget. Uh, in paper, we uh, in the pressure we we forget what was the LIFO basis or the FIFO basis. So the basic trick here is when you are getting the refund of the taxes, specifically in this case, you will be working backwards, and it is very difficult for you to move to the third or the second year initially. But it is very easy to go. For the last and first out basis so that is very simple for you if you opt for the lifo basis the tax refund will be easier so here you could actually do the terminal loss relief uh, adjustment against the previous three years trading income and you will be getting the tax refunds in this case now this is not the difficult part of the terminal loss relief the, uh, the in the examination we do get uh, a question where the, the closing rules of business basis periods are being applied and along with them we have to attempt the terminal loss relief as well so what we will be doing is i will i'll find a question i'll find a simple question that could actually uh, help you to understand how this terminal loss relief works for example there is a person who was working and whose accounts were prepared from 1st january i say 2016 till 31st december 2016 now you could see this is the normal accounting period for this person and uh, in this case the person had the profits of 6000 in the next year something has happened it started uh, like normal so the first uh, january 2017 the business started its new accounting period and eventually something happened that seized the business on 30th june 20 
17. So you could see the normal accounting date, as I told you uh, in the previous session, the normal account, yes, LIFO basis, LIFO basis. Okay, so the normal accounting date is not being followed. It was December normally, and now he has ended it on June. So this is the simple thing you could see that it is not following the normal trend. And in this case, for such business, the loss in this period was 12,000 pounds. Now, they say that you have to fall, uh, you have to calculate the terminal loss. Now, how you could calculate the terminal loss for the very calculation you need to do? Step number one is you have to find final 12 months of trade. So, can anybody tell me what are the final 12 months of the trade? In this case, the trade is ending on 30th June 2017. So, the final 12 months will be starting most probably from 1st july 2016 till 30th june 2017 so the most important point you need to note here is that this 12 month period is having some portion of second account second last accounting period and some portion of the last accounting period for your convenience i am writing it they are 12 months for you just to know and they are you could see they are six months so here when we have found the final 12 months of trade you could easily see that 1st July 2016 till 30th June 2017 is engaging the whole final accounting period and certain months of the second last accounting period. This is the first step you have to do. Second step you have to do is find the final tax year and compute the relevant profit and loss out of this. So what will be the final tax year in this? Can anybody tell me? No, you do 1718. Okay. So uh, can you specify the dates from where it is it will be starting or and where it will be ending? July 16. How come Evelyn? Uh, can you please elaborate? We are talking about the final text here. You are telling me how is busted. He says that it is 17, 18. Guys, try to under I thought it would be whole year. Why 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 it will be the whole year? No. We, this is the most common mistake that people do. You don't have to look for the whole year. You have to concentrate on what I have written here. In the very first step, what you will be doing is you will be finding the final 12 months of the trade. You have found those final 12 months of the trade. That is it. Now, among those final 12 months, I, I write here, among the final 12 months now it will be more uh, uh, logical for you to understand i have said that among the final 12 months find the final tax year and compute its profit and loss so the final tax year the tax year always starts on the 6th april you could see in this the business is seizing on 30th june 2017 for a business that is being seized for the business that is being seized on the date of cessation that tax year ends for him so the ending date for that tax year is the 30th june when the business ceases while the date of the start of the tax year is 6th april earlier that year that is 6th april 17 so we have computed 
out of these 12 months april till june april may and june three months out of these 12 months and the relevant thing is that you have to compute its relevant profit and loss now 12,000 is a loss of six months and you have taken three months out of these six months how will be uh, the loss computed here you will be taking the loss of three months that will be six thousand okay got it now among these 12 months you have taken three months here now you have to find the residue months among these 12 months three months tax here now you have to find the residue months and the residue months will be the period started on 1st july 2016 and the residue months will be see you came till 5th 6th april you have been taxed from 6th april onwards now you will be restricting yourself till 5th april 2017 okay any problems no once you've done that now at every point among these steps you could see that this 12 month period remains the same you see the final 12 months these are the final three uh, months and uh, first july 16 till 30th june 17 these 12 months are going side by side so what we have done is we have just broken these 12 months into the final tax year and the previous residue months they may be six they may be nine in this case they are nine now the last step you have to do is you have to segregate the last and second last accounting period in the residue months okay so we have these residue months and we have to segregate the last and the second last accounting period I hope you guys are understanding it and I'm not burdenizing your minds with the, all of this. So the last accounting period first, I will be sorting out the last accounting period. I'm writing it here for you that this is the last accounting period. You could easily see the last accounting period started on 1st January 17. I write 1st January 2017 till it ended on 30th june but we have taken 6th april 17 till 30th june 17 so 6th april 17 till 30th june 17 is already being sorted out we will be moving till 5th april 2017 now by sorting this out we will also be computing the relevant profit so six months prof uh, losses were 12,000 three months were dealt here remaining three months will be yielding the loss of 6,000 that we will place here any problems till now okay so the last accounting period done now the months of second last accounting period They will be from you could see first july 2017 till 31st december 2016 till 31st december 2016 okay so now the 6,000 profit for us was for 12 months. Now we have taken here the six months out of these 12 months. So the profit for this period will be positive 3,000. Now you could see very easily that by 
combining these i will be calculating my terminal loss the terminal loss here will be minus 6000 of the final tax year minus 6000 of the months following in the final accounting period plus 3000 falling in the second last accounting period yielding me the total of 9000 pounds as my terminal loss here yeah. it means that it is giving you an immediate relief of 3000 and rest of the 9000 pounds yes evelyn you're more than welcome i will be very happy answering your question yeah i know the loss is 6000 yeah yes okay evelyn complete your question i'll be answering it okay why nine thousand okay Pavad, i will explain it once how come you have put six thousand okay okay guys please uh, uh please concentrate i will be explaining this again look when i combine first july 2016 till 30th june 2017 i am taking this whole six months period from the last accounting period you agree till now okay and six months from the second last accounting period when i have computed my final tax year i have taken three months if 12,000 is the loss for one uh, for six months per month loss is 2,000. I have taken three months here. I am writing it for you. Three months. Okay. You could easily see that among these six months, I have taken three months. Now, when I found the residue months, in the residue months, I have total of nine months. I have total of nine months and among these nine months i have six months of second last period and three months of last period okay so among this can you please see and validate that you're getting the point from 1st July 2016 till 5th April 2017 you could see uh, uh, the second last accounting period was from 1st Jan 2016 till 31st December 2016 12 months I have taken this period from 2016 so July 2016 till December 2016 is the second last accounting period from 1st January 2017 till 5th April 2017, these are the three months of the final tax year. Okay, final uh, period. Now, when I have segregated this, last accounting period says, I have already mentioned from 1st January 2017 till 5th April 2017, per month losses, 2000, we are taken three months. So the loss accordingly will be multiplied by three. It will be 6000. You getting my point so now i combine this i'm i'm, I'm just getting uh, i'm just, i'm just uh, doing it a little bold so you could see now the whole last accounting period or the last period has been dealt 12000 was the total profit uh, loss 6000 in the final uh, tax year and 6000 here now among 12 months you have dealt with six months the residue six months pertain to the six months of the second last accounting period and the second last accounting period is yielding you the profit of six thousand for 12 months the per month profit is 
500 and you have taken six months here 500 into six says positive 3000 so the combined loss of 12,000 I could I, I will write it here for you Twelve thousand is the loss of the final realm, and these six months from that period, second uh, second last period, is yielding three thousand profits. So I am adding it up. Yeah, definitely. That's what I'm saying. No, 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 no. How could it be? First January twenty seventeen till fifth. April will be 12,000. How how come it is 12,000 is the loss for six months. January, February, March. They are three months. 12,000 divided by six multiplied by three can never be 12,000. It remains 6,000, buddy. This is no mathematics. And this once mathematically solved will yield 9,000. Guys, please gear up. If there is any issue, please let me know. Okay, Evelyn, you get it. Fawad, were you able to get it? And in the sham, is this understood? Okay, good. Thankfully, I'm really very happy uh for you guys putting up the effort and making this webinar uh adding into your uh academic knowledge i'm very much humbled if you are getting my points and uh, please can you go again <laughs> okay nami on what point you need me to uh enlighten i will do it again but guys, you have to consider that you have to uh, you have to concentrate because in these five days, okay, how you, how you get nine thousand? Okay, I'll explain it again quickly. In these five days, we need to cover the maximum. And if if you guys are slow, together what I've been explaining you for two, three, four times, it will be a little difficult for me to cover more and more and more topics. I really want that every topic that pains you could be. Uh, sorted out here with the example for that you have to gear up a little uh, I really uh, would encourage again uh, for the topics you want me to cover in the tomorrow in, in the tomorrow session meanwhile I'll help Tommy to understand how we get 9000 okay Tommy uh, 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 when we say that we are using the uh, terminal loss relief we are talking about the final 12 months of the trade now in the final 12 months of the trade we get these six months from the final period whose total loss is 12,000. In these final 12 months, I use three months from the second last accounting period. So the second last accounting period had 6,000 of profits for 12 months. When I calculate them for six months, they are equal to. 3000 now when i accumulate these months when i combine these months there is a negative of 12000 plus there is a positive of 3000 and when i round it off when i mathematically solve it it becomes 9000 12000 negative plus 3000 profits the basically you could understand thanks you get it okay okay uh, thankfully so i guess that's the end of the terminal loss okay thank you guys thank you so very much for this uh one thing i would like to add in the questions uh when the terminal loss relief is asked it is oftenly related to the basis period uh with the closing year rules so you have to concentrate uh how you are going to apply the closing year rules that i've been explaining you in the previous session so uh, be very careful uh that you oftenly get a question in which a trader has started they give you the opening months uh, uh some opening years 
in those opening years you apply in those opening years you apply the opening year rules and you calculate the overlap profit please listen to it very carefully you calculate the you apply the opening year rules and you calculate the overlap profits once you are done with that you start applying the ongoing year rules and suddenly the question says the business ceased there is no more operations of the business going on there is no so there is when the business ceases the business stops and you know that the overlap profits the business stops and you know that the overlap profits are to be settled here and when you calculate the terminal loss you have to be very much sure about the calculation of the terminal loss along with the overlap profits without committing any mistake that will be the key so a combined question from opening year rules ongoing year rules closing year rules along with the terminal loss may feature in your examination asking you for the relevant uh, for the relevant explanations yes but so the terminal loss should be carried back in fifo okay let me just see i'll confirm it no worries okay okay in one case it is lipo and one in in one case it is fifo I, i'll just confirm it no worries at all okay guys i would like you to move on the question that uh, i shared with you the question name is freya are you able to see my screens my screen Okay, guys. This question is related to uh, some areas of income tax and some areas of cooperation and some uh, residency ties. So uh, we are at uh, almost the closure of the session in coming 15, 20, 30 minutes. I will try to sum up the major things in the question. And we will be attempting it uh, maybe uh, tomorrow. And uh, uh, let's go through the question. The question is a little lengthy, and we need to know how to approach such kind of question. Uh, this is a question equivalent to 25 marks. But we did uh, with the question we did earlier was uh, worth uh, 20 marks. So this is uh, uh, this is a little bigger question than the previous one we attempted now uh, again i would request you the topics you want me to cover in tomorrow's session please uh, drop them in this comment section so that i can plan uh, them for you and the specific questions you want me to do uh, i will also be doing them for you okay now your manager has had a meeting Remittance basis charge by at least of say that is noted. I, let me take the picture of it. We have done the enterprise investment scheme question. I hope uh, some of the aspects are clear, and uh, for the rest of the aspects, we will be uh, okay. Okay, see, your manager has had a meeting with Freya, a client of your firm. She has sent you the memorandum she prepared 
following the meeting and an email detailing the work you are required to do now you could see that your manager can we go through its conditions and order in order for them to apply okay maybe uh, don't worry uh, I, 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 I'll, I'll make some notes in advance and I'll be sharing them uh, so that you could uh, get them in the handout section and I will be explaining them thoroughly hopefully okay so in this particular question your manager has a, had a meeting with your client and uh, she she has sent you the memo she prepared following the meeting and an email detailing the work you are required to do now again settle down a little and try to understand what the question is doing with you your manager after meeting with the client she sent you the memorandum she prepared from the meeting so the memo from the meeting and an email detailing the work you are requested so you have two sources you have to understand that you have two sources the information the data will be scattered in the meeting a memorandum being prepared by the manager and the email also will be having some critical information that you will be using to understand this so you have to highlight the critical information in the memo and in the email while going through the question how will you do so you have uh, you 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 have, gone, you have gone through the first introductory paragraph now you have to move on to the requirement so that you know so that you know what the question is asking you the question asks okay the question is asking carry out the work required as requested in email of your manager the following marks are available there is going to be some sale of business that is worth 13 marks there is a liability to income tax that is arising and class 4 nic contributions that is worth 8 marks we are very much clear that there are two kind of class for uh, there, there are two uh, kind of nic's being ap applied on a self employed person and land in beneda so this is what you have to do and the available marks are 13 for the sale of the business that we are going to do in this question eight marks for the liability of income tax again it is saying you the liability of the income tax if there is anything deducted under payee or under the uh, tax deduction at source we do not need to subtract it and calculate the income tax payable that step is not going to yield any extra mark since it clearly says that you have to calculate the income tax liability not the income tax payable in this case these points are little uh, but they actually uh, add a lot in your time management thing so you have to be very much careful about this now going back to the question they say that carry out the work required as requested in the email of your manager okay the email extract says that the sale of the business is here in the email but let's go through the question uh, completely and we'll come back to the email okay it says memo extract from your manager dated 7th september 2020 so you have to be very much sure about what date it is and when the things are going to happen and how you are going to account for in them uh, count them for in different taxes the idea of reading out this question today is that you could attempt it by yourself at your place and you could highlight the points where you were not able to understand the question or you were wasting your time so that we could have a thorough discussion tomorrow and we could actually uh, sort out 
the issues that you accounted for okay but the background says that Freya has been domiciled and resident in the UK more than 30 years and has not spent any single period of time overseas so she's consistently living in UK for more than 30 years no significant periods of uh, time spent overseas okay fair enough she started trading as an incorporated business in 2012 this is the day 2020 so opening year rules have been prepared the business will be going on the current year rule basis that is the accounting period will be the basis period and the overlap profits will not yet be settled if there was no change of accounting date as depicted in the question there is no change of accounting date in the question okay if you miss out on something i said you can always uh, uh drop a question and i'll be repeating myself without any uh issues okay she has started an unincorporated business in 2012 and has always prepared as accounts for 31st may each year so the basic period will be prepared accordingly this is this is the normal accounting date she follows freya's business in her, is her only source of income so there is no other income no property business income no interest income no employment income this is the only income that freya is having okay sale of freya's business now the business is being sold by freya please zoom it yeah sure sale of freya's business freya has received an offer of 2.3 million pounds from an unconnected party for all of the assets of her business if the offer is accepted so it says clearly the all the assets of the business there the business is not going to be sold on piecemeal basis all the assets will be sold a of this business if the offer is accepted her only chargeable asset for capital gain tax purpose will be the goodwill and her business premises so you could see your business premises and the goodwill will, will be the only things that will be going for the capital gains tax. this might be involving some uh, portion of the capital gains tax being applied and uh, some portion of the income tax when you say that there the capital gain tax will be applied you should be very much vigilant about any capital gain tax relief applied specifically the entrepreneur relief because the examiner in his comments has time and again mentioned that the student completely calculate uh, the chargeable gain or the applicable allowable loss in case of capital uh, gains tax but they are unable to detect the use unable to detect and implement the use of entrepreneur relief so after attending this webinar i would uh, really uh, want that you people do not miss out on the entrepreneur thing at least in the uh, questions that require you to apply that okay moving on the aggregate chargeable gains arising in respect of these assets will be 850 thousand pounds so the aggregate chargeable gains are here they are already calculated so offer was 2.3 million pounds and the gain is already calculated for you worth 850,000 pounds for both the goodwill and the business premises. However, once she is no longer working full time, Freya intends to live in the country of Benida and has asked us to consider whether she would save UK tax if she were to delay the sale of her business until after she left the UK so the residency criteria here is being asked that if she no longer lives in uk can she uh, save any taxes if she delays the sale of business until she moves out of uk so potentially we will be looking out on the residency criteria here while answering this question i agreed to advise freya on the following strategy the strategy devised by your manager now see this memo is detailing some background is detailing the offers made she can if she moves overseas and does not return for four years correct yeah yeah okay so understand what has been given to you in the question the background the offers made the figures that will be playing a critical role in the calculation 
and now she is telling you what she advised Preya on the following strategy. On 31st October 2020, your manager has said Preya that Preya will sell all of the assets on our business to FIM Limited, a UK resident limited company, in exchange for ordinary shares of worth 2.3 million. Preya will own the whole ordinary share capital of FIM Limited. So what what is happening here? The consideration will be received in the form of shares when it is received in the form of shares will any gain will arise there is no cash transaction involved can there be any gain if you don't have any cash how will you pay the cgt out of it no there is no 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 chance that there is any gain arising out of it because you don't have any cash yes and on 5th april 2021 preya and her family will move to baneda okay 31st October 20, they are doing this deal. On 5th April, they are going to move to Beneda. 30th April 2021, Freya will sell whole of the ordinary share capital of FIM Limited for cash proceed. So 30th April and 31st 2020, uh, 31st October 2021, they are falling in the different tax years. This is an important link. This might be an important link while moving on to the question further okay Priya's ideal scenario Priya would like to live in Beneda for no more than three years he never wants to live for more than three years and for no more than three years in Beneda she would buy a home there and would also retain her home in the UK so potentially we are going to have some things related to the uh, residential property of uh, her the principal private residence that she has in UK and one residence that she is going to have in Beneda. Priya would stay in her UK home for 55 days each year of which 25 would be working days. She would spend the rest of the time rest of her time in Beneda. So what she's saying every tax year 55 days of which 25 would be working days. Does this thing, thing matter? that you are spending days and out of them they are working days can anybody answer i will be waiting in the comments box while i move forward she would spend her rest of the time in Beneda. most of the time she's going to spend in Beneda. and freya does not intend to carry out any work in Beneda. she will be totally yes it does okay freya husband and children please elaborate ravi if you could please Preya's husband and children would remain in Beneda throughout the three year period and would not be resident in the UK. That's great. Preya's husband and children will remain in Beneda throughout the three year period. They are not coming back to UK and would not be resident in the UK. This is clear from this scenario. Okay. Now they are talking about some things in un un unincorporated business. Now, all the uh, information that you feel critical, you could highlight it. unincorporated business financial information is given here a single set of accounts will be prepared for the 17 month period ending 31st october 2020 so this is the 17 month period the budgeted adjusted tax pro uh, the budgeted tax adjusted profit for this period before deduction of capital allowance is 94000 so there might be some calculation of capital allowance that you have to do independently the writing down uh, values as at 31st May 2019, were main pool zero cars with the private use 8700. When the car is with the private use, and if you dispose it off, you are only going to consider the business portions for the qualification of an allowed expense. Moving on, on 1st September 2019, Freya purchased planted machinery for use in her business costing 4200. So, this is the planted machine for use in her business. So it might qualify for WDA at the rate 18% or it might qualify for AIA if it is available. If the business is ongoing, it will be available. If the business is not ongoing, it won't be available. On 31st October 2020, the planted machinery used in her business, excluding the motor car, will have a market value of 6300. Every item will be sold for less than its cost. So when you sell 
every item for less than its cost then what will be happening you will be having balancing allowance won't be having any balancing charges any problems in love about the points we discussed that i feel are relevant or maybe that i feel i could talk them out would it be a chattel less than 6k Not less than 6k. It, 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 it is saying that it is more than 6,000. Uh, it is 6,300. Yes, it can be. Okay, Freya will withdraw a motor car. Uh, will withdraw a motor car from business. Or uh, yes, it can. It, it can go either ways. We have to see. Uh, we have to see what what the uh, what the scenario is and how we are going to apply it. Yes. It can be a turtle, no, no issues in that. Preya will withdraw a motor car from the business on 31st September 2020. The car has always been used 65% for business purpose and will have a market value of 11100, which is less than the car's original cost. So, uh, time, uh, so what we will be doing is we will be apportioning it for the business and the private percentages. Preya and FIM Limited will submit a succession election to HMRC. That's cool. There are unrelieved overlap profits from the commencement of the business equivalent to 31,400. Obviously, as I told you, the business is going to cease when the business will be ceasing. In the closing year rules, we are going to accommodate these 31,400 overlap profits that were arising there. Land and Beneda, Preya's father, Alvaro moved to the UK and became UK resident on 6 April 2006. He is domiciled in Canada and has owned a plot of land for a uh, plot of land there for many years. He's considering giving this land to Freya within next 12 months. So the land is going to be sold by his father to Freya within next 12 months. I agree to advise Freya on whether or not such a gift could result in an inheritance tax liability for her. Alvaro is not well and is unlikely to live for further seven years. We should therefore assume all the future potentially exempt transfer will become chargeable to IHT. They might become chargeable to IHT, but we cannot under, uh, under but we cannot simply ignore the use of the taper relief in this case. Because Alvaro makes regular substantial lifetime gifts of assets situated in UK, we should also assume that there will be no real rate band or annual exemptions available in respect of gift of this land. It says that you don't have to go and find the annual exemptions. Whatever the annual exemption or whatever the nil rate band is, it is being used consistently by Alvaro, the father of Freya. Okay. So this is what the memo has to say. And the question has said that it is not only the memo, it has the email as well that is going to be uh, providing you some important uh, aspects of this uh, conversation between your manager and Freya. The additional information in respect of the country of Veneta is there is no, this is the extract of email now. So you will be combining both the data and then you will be seeing how this question could be uh, addressed for its requirements there is no capital gains in Veneta, so no worries at all no ddr is going to be applied there is no double taxation treaty between uk and Veneta. no capital gain tax and for the other things there is no double tax treaty between uk and Veneta. please carry out the following work now she's ex she's instructing you that these are the tasks that you have to do in light of the information shared by her through that memo okay for the sale of business we have seen that 13 marks are pertaining to the sale of business and what is your manager saying about the sale of business calculate the CGT which would be payable by Freya on the sale of her business if she does not incorporate her business but simply sells all her business assets for 2.3 million on october 
20 31st uh, october 2020 to an unconnected purchaser explain the rate of cgt which would be charged the rate of cgt which would be charged this is a very 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 tricky but easy part for you the annual exempt amount will not always be will not be available to freya and she will be the high rate taxpayer in the tax year of sale since she is the high rate taxpayer the applicable rate will be uh, the higher one and we have to see if the entrepreneur relief is available in these cases if the conditions of entrepreneur relief are met we will be using the tax rate of 10 percent of entrepreneur on this let's see uh, in the further information so first thing that you are being asked for the sale of business is that you have to calculate the cgt for freya second is explain the cgt implications of the proposed sale of freya's business now they are not going for that film limited scenario in the first case first case is you you are not going to sell it to the uh, to the uh, to the film limited you're just selling it as a uh, as an independent person uh, without making it into a corporation so the second case is that you are you have to explain the cgt implication of the proposed sale of the freya's business to film limited in exchange of shares worth 2.3 million where i told you that this is an exchange against the shares there are no cash element involved i can confirm that all the conditions necessary for the incorporation relief to apply of this transaction will be satisfied and no and that no election will be made to disapply this relief we will be applying incorporation relief here on the assumption freya lives in beneda for three years from 5th april 2021 in accordance with the ideal scenario explain our uk resident status for those three years now you have to do what you have to do the independent of film limited calculation the cgt calculation the command word is you have to calculate the cgt here you have to explain the cgt implications if you are doing it in the film limited uh, scenario and on the third say on the assumption prayer lives in Bereda for three years from 5th april 2021 what will be uh, in accordance with the ideal scenario as she told you in the memorandum you have to again explain her UK resident status for those three tax years. I have done some preliminary work on Freya's resident status and can confirm that Freya will be neither automatically non UK resident nor automatically UK resident while she lives in Canada because of her father's domicile. Maybe on the assumptions that Freya is non UK resident for tax year 2021, explain any changes which would not, which would need to be made to Freya's ideal scenario in respect of her time in Baneda in order for these to be no UK CGT on the sale of shares on Femme Limited. She says that you have to assume that Freya is non-UK resident for 2021 and you have to again explain any changes, the change, uh, the, the previous scenario and now on the basis of being non-UK resident, what will be the changes? from uh, in comparison to the previous scenario so three parts asking you to explain one part asking you to calculate and explain the cgt the rate of cgt which you will be charging that you have to explain why you are charging uh 10 percent or 20 percent or 28 percent maybe if it is the case of the residential property being a high rate taxpayer the b part is liabilities to income tax in class 4 and i see on the assumption freya sells her business to film limited on 31st october 2020 calculate her liability to income tax and class 4 and i see for her final tax year of trading see you have to compute all of it i can again it is in calculate no explanations required i can confirm that freya will not receive any taxable income from film limited it says only thing you have to consider here is this land in Benita. explain whether or not a gift of the land by alvaro to freya at some time in next 12 months could result in a uk inheritance tax fairly a straightforward thing easy four marks for you now this question is worth 25 marks i've taken around 10 to 15 minutes to read out this question and uh explain the scenarios that maybe and not 
in reference to the requirement but just to go through the information all the points that my mind had uh, with me after reading them i have tried to explain you now this is for you that you go through this question again and you try to attempt it we will be attempting it again tomorrow i won't be reading out the question again tomorrow we will start moving to the solution it would be better for you if you have gone through the question and uh, we could simply uh, be highlighting the issue that you face uh, guys i would request you to please uh, share the topics that i you want me to do uh, in the tomorrow session other than that i will be doing two questions i have selected for you for tomorrow session uh, that will be our second last session and uh, one thing i i remember doing was the application of seven year accumulation period that i will be doing through a question now we could call off our session if you could uh, review the reliefs reliefs of cgt or iht api bpi you are talking about ravi okay 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 sure we could simply go through the reliefs of cgt and iht uh, very well traced okay anything else sir could you please elaborate the term tax implication like explain okay i, I will atisham uh explain the term tax implication like explain and calculate okay if them when they say calculate they are not requiring anything uh in the form of explanation they are simply saying it all those relevant calculations that are used to calculate you have to do them simply don't need to write any explanation to what you are doing but when it says explain it could say you explain only or it could say you explain with the calculations if applicable so if if it says like only explain you just have to explain all the implication but if it says explain with supporting calculations then you have to use the calculations some smaller calculations not the full calculations smaller calculations that would actually explain why we are doing that i hope your answer is just is addressed evelyn you say iht and cgt relief and go through a question of each okay so the tomorrow's agenda will be iht and cgt reliefs and i will be trying to attempt the question uh, along with you people and uh, i would request you to tell me for uh, the friday session as well i guess corporation tax remains there if you have any troubles in substantial shareholding exemption that is uh, an important topic and withdrawal of investment we have considered it uh, a little in our first uh, session but it can be uh, elaborated so it depends purely upon your will since i have seen uh, many of you guys attending the sessions consistently so this webinar is dedicated to you people i will be addressing the topics and the questions you will be asking me i have taken the pictures of uh, the the recommendations that you people have sent me and i will be addressing them i hope uh, this session was fruitful for you and uh, you are welcome for any feedbacks and i hope this helps you in your preparation the key thing again you don't you just don't rush into the answer you go through the requirement for that whatsapp group sir please share your number uh, evelyn i shared my number but i am going to share it again in full format 0092345850384 you guys are welcome to uh, ask me questions but for the whatsapp group i will be making it please don't uh, text me again and again for make it for make it like just share your numbers just write your number and uh, tell me that you are the student of the webinar i will be making it whatsapp group and we can later on uh, be sorting out your problem so uh, let's call it a day i hope it was fruitful for you thank you very much and uh, good night guys